about the Carbon App live meetings being live streamed. Thank you. Um, uh, the the new Carbon App that has been produced uh, for and by Essex County Council. So you'll see that in the chat, and there's a link in the next message to um, to download it. So you can be doing that quietly whilst this meeting is continuing if you haven't already done so. Uh, lots happening in, um, uh, as many of you will well know, um, I'm kind of super impressed really with how much is being achieved. And, and also I have to say more and more um, feedback from people saying how, um, how much is being achieved within Greater Essex um, in, in the areas that we're focusing on. I mean, it's two years since the completion of the report our net zero report with the 100 plus recommendations. Um, and I think it's just a scan back over those to look at how much has been achieved, including the regular summaries that Louise and team are sending around to everybody, I think just shows you um, that, uh, that everyone deserves a pat on the back for really remarkable work. So thank you all for that. Um, no other kind of parish notices really. I think we'll just get kind of straight on into um, discussing the uh, the SIGs. Um, so item one is update from SIG leads. And if you um, you've got your your powerpoints, we'll do land use and green infrastructure first. Although of course that's the focus of today's meeting. So we're going to come back to that in detail from John. Energy waste, built environment, transport, community engagement, and then the just transition, which as many of us will know is receiving more and more um, national political attention. Um, I think we can put it that way. Um, and <coughs> thereby creating a real opportunity to do new stuff. So thank you again, everybody. We're going to press on. So I think, John, are you beginning with a little summary of the of the Luigi group? Um, yeah. And uh, then we'll come back to, obviously, to biodiversity nature, nature recovery, net gain, and so forth later on in the meeting. Oops, so sorry. I was remote there. I so, think we're putting the slideshow up, is yeah. that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are, yeah. okay, fine. That's fine. Um, and we're kicking off with land use and green infrastructure. So if we go to... Uh, sorry, John, I'm just having a little bit of trouble with my screen here. Didn't want to play. That's okay. On presentation mode, if you can. Yeah, no, I'm trying, Jules. There we go. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Great. Okay. So, and next Lovely. one. Far away, John. Yep. Okay. We go to the next one. Um, so, you, oh, no, you go back one. Go back one. Yeah. Um, so, I was there just going go. to say, Jules had just said it. Jules was on the Land Use and Green Infrastructure Group. We're going to be talking about LMP. Net Zero, Innovation Futures, and Biodiversity Net Gain. So today is all about land use and green infrastructure. I also just wanted to use the, the quote because everything that this commission does is difficult. And some people say, oh, God, you know, it's impossible. But there's a great quote from Muhammad Ali, which I think we should all hold with us, which is, impossible is not a fact, it's an opinion. Impossible is not a declaration, it's a dare. Impossible is, a, is potential, impossible is temporary, impossible is nothing. And I kind of love that when I when I go forward and think we have just got to do this. And I remember, Jules, you were in the Land Use and Green Infrastructure Group when we had a really interesting conversation with a planner. And I think you said it's it, planning is great, but it's now the time for ambition. Uh, and that's what we're all doing here. And, and we, we have some great ambition here in land use and green infrastructure. So next slide, please, uh, Louise. So the climate focus area, which was um, um, one of the key recommendations of the uh, Land Use and Green Infrastructure Group, we've been marching on. We've done three parish nature plan consultations uh, in the climate focus area in Wivenhoe. I went to the one on a Sunday in Stysted and Tiptree, and we did that with a national charity called Involve. The North Essex Farm Cluster has now been constituted as a CIC, a community interest company, so that's moving on. We're having a second cluster in the wings, in tendering, uh, covering approximately 50 farms, and there are several other clusters in, in, in uh, embryonic form now throughout the county, so we're very excited about that. Uh, we set up a, a, a knowledge hub 
for the CFA, and, and that's really driven by the local community. And the CFA comm strategy has been approved, and our first press releases are going out. And so you're going to see a lot more profile of the CFA. So we go on to the next one. So also in county, we just uh, approved the tree management plan and we, for which we have a vision. And you'll, you'll be interested to see that this commission's recommendation is in that vision, that Essex County Council will lead the way on creating 30% natural green infrastructure by protecting and increasing the tree stock on the county's own estate. So I won't go into the objectives, but it's a really important uh, strategic view that we hold quite a lot of trees and woodlands and hedges in Essex. We're looking after what we've got and we're going to expand that tree stock. So. Um, that's in the pack, so I'll move on again quickly. And then finally, uh, just an update on the Essex Forest Initiative. We started this from a standing start three years ago, uh, and this year we almost planted 100,000 trees and 13 kilometres of hedges. So we're almost up to the quarter of a million mark, and that goes from strength to strength uh, year on year. This year, we look, we're looking for a substantive grant from uh, um, Forest Commission through the Local Authority Treescape Fund and the Urban Tree Challenge. Um, so it, that that looks very good at the moment. So um, year on year, um, the Essex Forest Initiative is really achieving great things. And that is just a very thumbnail sketch of land use and green infrastructure. So I'm done, I think. Yeah. Fantastic, John. Could I just ask one question? If you go back one slide, Louise. Um, this is this is a, a kind of input measure, measuring the number of trees. And I know this is standard, and many people will be aware of of uh, uh, you know concerns about how long things survive for. Do, are we do we are we having any kind of sense of measurement of of one to five year survival rates or something of that kind of nature, so that at some point we're able to say we planted two hundred and fifty thousand in three years and you know, we meet the expected survival rate of whatever it is, 95%. Because yeah. you do hear quite often people saying, yikes, yeah. we planted this number and they're all dead kind of thing. So, how so, do we, so we, we get that, we get that quite a lot. And mm. last year was the driest mm. summer on record. And we had to go back and replant 25,000 trees. They're not in these figures, they're, mm. they're, they're last year's figures, but we did that again. Our view, and my view as I was director of Thames Chase Community Forest in the past is that actually, you know, we, we just go back and replant and whatever it costs us, we have to replant. We cannot accept that people said, oh, yeah, but you only 50 percent survived. Mm. We will always go back and replant and we use certain techniques to improve our um, ability to survive. For instance, we don't use herbicides for obvious reasons, but the benefit of, her, uh, of using mulches is that it keeps the moisture in. And we had really good survival rates on that basis last year. Even though we did lose 25,000 trees, we went back and planted them all. Fantastic. I just wonder whether in these presentations we might say something about net number of trees or net new trees planted so that the, so that you just kind of head off at the past those kinds of questions about about um, replanting or putting a footnote yeah. almost. Yeah, to, well, to we, do, we don't include any replants in our figures they're all new trees yeah because yeah. we, yeah. we don't want to be accused of uh, doubling up we no no certainly we could that. put that on and in our information yeah. in some way yeah. um super thank you that was great victoria question yeah, yes thank you very much uh, along a, a similar lines if you if you like i mean these are phenomenal figures these sort of quarter of a million trees nearly planted in the last three years it's fantastic work we all know how much the public love trees radio for today program running a uh, running a, a, an item all week um, with the, the you know, the nation's favourite trees. Mm. I've got just got no idea of the scale mm. of how many trees there are, and you know, it, it's it, this seems like a massive number. But have we got any sort of estimate of how many trees there are in the counties? This shows is this sort of zero point one percent we're adding to the stock each year, or is it greater than that? And that just may be too difficult to answer. Um, and then I guess if I was going to be a bit more brutal about it and a member of the public, I may be saying, well, that's all very well, but tell me how many you cut down. Um, now, I don't know if you did cut any down, but you know the high profile councils that did uh, recently. So I just wondered if that might be reflected as well. Um, uh, but I think it's great work anyway. And I don't think we can underestimate just how important trees are in this conversation. Thank you. Thanks very much. Great. Um, I, I, I'll come back to you in a moment. Um, John, but Jackie with a 
with a further question or comment? Well, no, it was actually just to, to build on this, this idea of keeping ourselves up to date. You'll, you'll get it in the next analysis, which we're going to present. Mm. It's just to say that one of the things that we can already <clears throat> do regularly is show you where the trees are that have gone in, but more importantly, how much the length of hedgerows is going up so that we're really seeing the impact that it's having. And then the final bit is we've finished some trials looking at how to increase the survivorship to literally 99% of trees by making sure they have the right soil microbiome around them as they go in. So it's, it's, it's moist, but it's also got the, it's like a starter pack. And we've had <clears throat> four trials done planting out 50,000 trees very quickly in five different locations and not one tree has died. So it's really coming back to this issue of yeah. the tree in the soil gets out there and then and then it you know then you don't have to go back and maintain it so that's one of the things that we could also start to encourage people to think about not just the tree but the soil and where it's coming from and where it's going back in it's the right tree in the right place fantastic good observation john can you say anything about the stock of trees uh, victoria's question now, just, just, um, uh, yeah quarter of a million uh, 250 million not quarter of a million mm -hmm. 250 000, yeah quarter of a million mm -hmm. is adding to that yeah so very quickly, I think from memory, we have done some um, estimates based on uh, uh, it was a remote sensing um, thing. And I think it was around about five million trees. That gives you some sense to be. You know, but having said that, we're one of the least wooded counties in the UK. I think Cambridge is the least. I think we have about six percent tree cover. National average is 12 percent. So it's half. So one of our objectives is to get up to the national average at least, so doubling our tree cover, uh, which is no mean feat. Um, so um, that is, uh, our, I think that was also in the Climate uh, Action Commission's recommendations as well. So, yeah, you know, it, these are these are steep, steep challenges, but ones that we have to rise to. Fantastic. Very good. Thanks very much indeed. Great. OK, lovely. Let's come back to biodiversity and nature and land in a short while. Thank you for that. You've still got your hand up, Jackie, just for Oh, info. sorry. Yeah. Yep. No, that's no, fine. Um, energy and waste. Who's leading on this one? That's me, Jules. Thank you. Um, oh, great. Tom, thanks very much, Thomas. Yep. That's OK. Um, so just a quick update. We on, on work that brings retrofit and community energy together. We've submitted a, a bid to the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero for a local energy advice demonstrator project, which will be looking at this idea of retrofitting whole areas. So whole streets, whole villages, whole parishes. Um, the fund has, has been announced, but unfortunately it's embargoed at the moment. So I can't give the outcome of that just at the minute. Um, but alongside that, we are also um, developing a bid into the National uh, Lottery Fund, but the Energy and Climate Action Fund that's been announced, um, we're looking at a, a bid to support community energy and retrofit work across the whole of Essex. Um, really pleased to say that we've secured another tranche of funding from the Home Upgrade Grant. Um, the funding allocation for Essex <coughs> has now been confirmed, and that will be 25 million pounds of funding for uh, low income households uh, that will be funding available for the next couple of years. Um, we're also working with the districts to access um, en the energy company obligation fund. So this is, four billion pounds worth of funding that's available through till March 2026 as part of the energy industry's uh, funds for uh, uh, retrofit measures in low income households. And there's a fund that historically we've not accessed very successfully in Essex, but we're working with the districts on a county wide uh, scheme. So next slide, please. Um, We've also been successful in accessing funding from several Innovate UK projects in the Pioneering Places Fund, something called S Essex Net Zero or SNET, which is community-led investment in solar and storage at scale. Um, again, off the back of the community energy work that we've been successful in developing, really interesting project. There's a relatively small fund at the moment, but it's enabling us to bid into the next round of funding, which will, which will be... Um, more significant uh, pots of money. But the idea behind this project, again, is to enable community-led projects for local renewable energy generation storage, where we can keep more of the benefits of that renewable energy in the local community through trading and sharing renewable energy locally and also delivering benefits to the energy grid. Um, similar project, which we've, which we've been successful in with Innovate UK and Pioneering Places is called Shift to Net Zero, 
which is looking to scale up investment in getting our schools to net zero and using schools as local power plants effectively, where they could be generating more energy than they need and being able to sell that to the local school community. So really interesting, really exciting um, project there. Um, we did also bid into the Innovate UK Fast Followers Fund with Rochford District Council for a similar um, concept of a local community energy project and, and with schools as power plants. Unfortunately, that I just heard the other day that wasn't successful, but we are working with Rochford District Council to look at alternative funding sources for their for their projects there. Um, we were also successful in bidding into the Ofgem Strategic Innovation Fund for something called Project Shield, which is looking at technology solutions for low cost heat and power and to low income households that bid was successful again a relatively small fund at this scale but we're now developing our bid for the alpha stage which will be development of that concept and a small scale trial if we're successful in that then there's a further beta round of funding which will be significant sums of money to to roll that concept out uh, to benefit low income households the next slide and then just lastly on community energy, um, the Pathways project that we run to support community energy groups, which has been recognised nationally in the Community Energy England Awards this year, and has been sponsored by Department for Energy Security and Net Zero for a national rollout. Um, we have, uh, we're in the process of extending that to March 2024. That has um, seen four new social enterprises, community interest companies set up in Essex. So we, we hope to double that number in the next couple of years. Um, this uh, this is a, a you know, really successful program in developing community energy groups. Those groups themselves have now developed business plans and have an investment pipeline of several million pounds worth of local energy projects that they're looking to fund and develop. Just one example of that is the Tolsby Climate Partnership, who have successfully secured £450,000 £450, worth of government grant funding to decarbonise the local school. And I'm really pleased to say that they've just completed a community share offer and successfully surpassed their target of £200,000 community funds to supplement that project. Um, really, really exciting project, which we're delighted to be a part of. Um, we're also working with solar developers. Um, I mentioned Longfield Solar Farm in particular um, to, to ensure that we access community benefit funds from those projects. Um, the first of those, which is currently going through planning, so this is all subject to that uh, development gaining consent should enable us to secure a significant sum um, over the life of that project for community, local community projects in in that case Braintree and Chelmsford but we are working with developers on schemes across the rest of the county to look at similar opportunities and then just lastly <clears throat> Solar Together continues to run uh, well um, this is the current scheme uh, in 2023 we've had over a thousand acceptances um, and we're already well into the installation process with over 150 installations done to date. And that's a very, very quick pen picture of some of the recent work we've been doing on energy and retrofit. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Thomas. Fantastic. Really, really encouraging. I don't think any of us a couple of years ago would have could have yeah. envisaged um, the amount of resource that's being attracted into the county by all of these different schemes, sometimes by communities, sometimes releasing their own resources like in Tolsbury, sometimes access, accessing government or research councils. I mean, there's, this is this is fantastic. It strikes me, Louise, at some point, and this might be asking a really difficult question, it would be useful to summarise the amount that is being attracted in, not just in for energy and retrofit, it, but the amount of money that's being attracted into the county by the activities of the um, Climate Action Commission, because I think that number alone would be quite interesting. Um, that I can see it could have complications to even just kind of add it all up, but it's a thought. Um, is there anything, uh, Thomas, on on this? I don't want to be a kind of you know bent record on this one, but um, on on car parks, covering car parks, I'm I'm keen on kind of the space that is you know underutilized or not utilized at all just for parking things that we move around in um increasing interest in in covering car parks with solar um are we seeing any kind of actual initiatives emerging on that side in the county in the greater county um yes there is a piece of work that um in the process of developing to look at our park and ride sites mm. so there has uh 
always been this idea that we could put a uh, solar canopy across the park and ride site at Colchester. And I know some of our other park and ride sites are being expanded. So we are in the process of looking at that again. Um, I think there's a wider, potentially a wider opportunity to look at other public parking spaces, which really suit the districts rather than counties. So that is a, that's a point I can take, take away and happy to have a discussion with the districts. I'm sure some of them are looking at that um, as an opportunity. But yes, yeah, we're looking at that um, as, a, as a live opportunity right now. Brilliant. OK, great. Thank you for that. Uh, Jerry, a question. Uh, just a, a comment, just to, to highlight the, the use of solar for sound barriers alongside um, roads, because the, I think that's a really key area. It get, gets the, the benefit not only of the solar generation, but also noise reduction. And of course, if you're going to have a sound barrier anyway, you may as well make it out of something that can generate energy. So and just also to highlight uh, uh, the growing use of agrivoltaics, so that they're combining land yeah. use with solar generation as well. And just to to therefore see how we can overcome the sort of some of the, the claims of taking prime agricultural land and, and solarizing it. Um, and then also, of course, linking in solar generation with biodiversity gain, which uh, Grid Survey got quite a lot of experience with. So we'd be happy to give some steer and guidance in that area if that would be helpful. Superb. Thank you very much, Jerry. Excellent. Um, uh, the th we, we are going to come to the last of the SIGs on the just transition, but it's quite clear, Thomas, that in quite a lot of what you've talked about, it is about creating a just transition. It's focused on low income households. It's focused upon a kind of leveling up within the county. And that's a, a very good thing. And you can see the overlap. There's just a question from Alan Goggin, which perhaps you could come back to Councillor Alan Goggin uh, later on about kind of single households and also definitions of low income. There will be standards for that, I'm sure. But perhaps you can chop that into the chat after you've done the, the next bit as well at some point. Um, so, yeah, very good. Thank you very much indeed for that. Shall we press on into waste then? Good morning, everybody. Um, just to give you a quick update on what's happening within the world of um, world of waste. Um, a key focus for us at the moment has been on developing a joint um, shared vision um, for waste um, for the county. So this is um, being developed um, by all 13 um, local authorities um, that have a, um, a role in um, collecting and um, treating and disposing of waste. Um, this is a 30 year vision um, with a, um, a action plan of core activities and is, is there to set that strategic approach on how we're going to, to deal with waste, really looking at embedding that circular economy principle within the um, ways in which we both um, collect, treat and dispose of waste. The, the document itself is, is getting to the point of, of um, finalisation, um, which will enable us then to go out for public consultation on the core priorities um, and targets that we're um, looking to propose um, within that strategy. And that consultation is programmed to be launched in um, autumn of um, this year, which um, should enable us to get to a position of um, um, strategy adoption um, in the early part of, um, of 2024. That will then lead on to a whole series of action planning um, activities um, in terms of delivery of that, that um, strategic approach. I think the key priority I really wanted to highlight um, alongside the sort of the, the, the guiding principle of the um, circular economy and achieving zero waste is actually really driving forward decarbonisation of um, waste collection um, and um, treatment services but also really driving forward high levels of, um, of um, waste avoidance, um, as well as um, high levels of, of recycling and trying to place Essex very much as a, as a world leader um, within, that, um, within that field. Next slide, please. Also just dealing with some of the, um, the, um, the other project activities we've got um, underway. Um, food waste, we've um, secured a long-term disposal um, treatment solutions for food waste um, generated in Essex. Um, so this gives us capacity to be able to treat all food waste through anaerobic digestion. Um, that's been secured now for the next um, 12 years. Um, and um, obviously that has um, significant benefits in terms of um, generation of um, of um, energy um, from um, the treatment of that, that material stream. And Alongside that, we now have new collection services also being rolled out into areas where we weren't um, previously collecting food waste. 
although we had a really good coverage um, historically, um, we weren't so um, or didn't have so much um, good coverage within some of those hard to reach areas, particularly flats. We're now starting to see um, flat coverage increase and we've got a program of activity um, with um, all of our districts to look at getting um, universal coverage of food waste now out to all households um, within the next um, within the next three years. Um, so we're very much now on that trajectory that we've got the treatment solution in place as well as the um, the, the collection regime to ensure that um, residents are able to to participate. And then working alongside that, um, it's actually on the, on the next slide, but I'll, I'll touch on it now. We've got um, under the influencing behaviour and education, we've got a, a piece of work that is um, is focusing on enabling residents to, to participate in terms of raising awareness, understanding of the importance of, of food waste recycling, so we can actually get the participation in those services increased as well as the um, as well as the capture of that that material um, in terms of, um, of waste uh, reduction and reuse activity we've rolled out um, a increased reuse offer now through our recycling centers as a small trial we're testing various approaches with the intention now to get that rolled out across um, um, a number of sites across the county to enable more residents to um, participate in reuse activities, donate items for reuse. And we've got that linked in with um, community sector providers who are actually undertaking the, the reuse activity, um, local employment and training opportunities as well. And then putting those reusable items back into, um, particularly into low income families, um, ensuring there's, there's access for, um, for those items and, and extending the life of them. Next slide, please. And then finally, um, I just really wanted to touch on the on the curbside uh, recycling services. We've got um, comprehensive service reviews underway in um, almost half of our um, districts um, and borough councils, looking at the services they provide, looking at how they can improve access to those services and also improve and increase the range of, um, of materials collected. Some of those are focusing on um, flexible plastics and electrical items. But we've also got other ones um, looking at the um, the blockages that exist for residents in terms of participating services and um, exploring ways in which we can overcome those, make those those services more accessible. We're then looking to take the learning from those pilot areas and looking to roll that out across the county um, to ensure that we can, um, as I say, increase the uh, the capture and participation services. Um, that was a very quick whistle stop um, tour. Happy to take any questions. Jason, thanks very much indeed. Fantastic. I do like the focus on kind of moving it literally upstream here mm -hmm. to affect behaviours and um, uh, and the kind of consumption cycle that actually produces the, the waste in the first place. Of course, by using standard measures like GDP, when we produce waste and we add the re treatment of and engagement with waste into our GDP measures as kind of part of our success. But of course, it's like all parts of the consumption cycle, measuring that end bit of the damage is not a good thing. So um, this, this is great. And I like all the engagement with community uh, as well. It's, that's fantastic. Um, I can guess that um, possibly, well, there'd be unfair to guess what Paul is going to raise a comment on, but um, <laughs> uh, but where you're from, Paul, um, you may uh, have a particular comment. So uh, welcome. Actually, I wasn't going to bring up the incinerator. Oh, right. Okay, uh, no, that's, that's my, uh, my bad. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, it, was the, it was the comments about the um, collecting waste or food waste from flats, which is um, somewhere I, where I think that... Um, much improvements can be made to increase recycling rates so that that food waste from black isn't going into black bin and then into um, landfill. Uh, but I, I'm glad to hear that that is being increased. But um, there's a in in Congershall, um, where I actually live. There's there were some flats and the tenants wanted the, the green or, or food waste collected and they had to jump through massive hoops to get it to get it to be accepted by. Rachel Council. They even had to cite that it needed two district councillors to pull the officers together to get it sorted out. And they, the tenants had to sign an affidavit to, to prove that they or to swear that they weren't businesses um, so that they can have, get their green bins uh, collected. So although I'm glad to hear it's it's increasing or it's looking to be increased, the, the, the experience of uh, residents might not be quite the same and if I think the people that in these particular flats were keen to get it done but in, in lots of flats a lot of people wouldn't be bothered to go that far with signing affidavits and, and things like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's yeah. A, no, that, I mean, that, yeah, I mean, I think that really demonstrates some of the some of the challenges and that some of the misconceptions that, that flat recycling doesn't work. We we can we've demonstrated it can work. And what we're looking to do is, as I say, is really take that that good practice around how it can work and making sure that that is understood at all levels of the of the partnership. Because as you say, I think there's a education piece not just for the public. There's often an education piece for officers as well. So we're making sure that that is understood how this can can operate, um, so we can get a um, a, a single approach that, that works across the county. Good point. And and where it's not working, let let's let's kind of welcome that information because that is a way. There's nothing worse than getting people interested and then blocking it through yeah. through sins of usually omission, not commission. It's just people kind of acting in a particular kind of way. Um, uh, but we need to to make that as easy as possible, don't we? So thank you, Paul. That's a really good comment. I'll leave it with you, Jason, to kind of pick up on on that. Jackie, mine was just to pick up um, when we took in the sort of the waste and the food. I was absolutely delighted about that. But we had a conversation, do you remember, with our youth members around mm. schools. How, how is that going? Are schools now part of that system? Because that was, uh, do you remember? Yeah, yes, yes, we, we, we have got them a part of the system in, in the majority of our areas. We've still got a few areas which we're working on. Um, but yeah, we're now starting to see food waste service provision being provided as part of the, 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 the overarching waste services provided to our schools so where okay. there is a, a, a food waste already operating yeah they're able to participate in that um yeah there, there are always some um some logistics with that um but yeah we're working those through on, on a case-by-case -case basis with those schools so first port of call yeah we get in the schools to speak to the to, to the districts understand the services that, that's offered and then they're being put onto that that service as part of the the, the regular collection thank you lovely thanks very much jason fantastic uh, let's press on um to the built environment thank you very much for that that's great and it's great to see how important waste is to the the whole decarbonization of the economy and um, that we're all seeking so uh, the built environment super important as well um yep yeah thank you very much uh, jules Graham, so yeah, uh if we um so this update is really focusing on one of the exam questions which was in net zero housing by 2025. Um, and why is, why is that important? Because Essex is gonna grow by 20% by 2050. So we've got a real opportunity to influence the future. Next slide, please, uh, Louise. So just to bring us up to speed. So you'll probably remember that um, we had a piece of work done not that long ago that told us government's future homes uh, standard in 2025 uh, was this, and then the uh, passive house was slightly more expensive, just a fraction, 2,000 pounds. Well, one of the other pieces of work that we've been working on with the Essex planning officers, the chief planning officers, is they wanted legal assurance that they can exceed the building regulations. And we're pleased to say that piece of work has now been completed. It says, yes, we can. Uh, it's published on the Essex Design Guide website, and more importantly, there are six councils now throughout the country that are operating planning policies achieving net zero homes. So just to run through them, Cornwall, Bath, North East Somerset, and Central Lincolnshire, which is a group of three Lincolnshire authorities. So you'll all find that useful information on the, the Essex Design Guide's website. Uh, under the sort of the, the the net zero banner, but so so that's that's really important. So if we go to the next slide, so what that tells us, so just in summary, so we know they're less, they're only fractionally more expensive. We know legally we can do it, and we know that we can move forward with the policies. So what is the game changer? The game changer is this. So if so what we're looking at, and this is a sort of a, something that's come through the chief planning officers, the Essex planning officers, if we can remove the stamp duty from net zero new homes, instantly that makes them cheaper than government's future home standard. And we think this is a real game changer in moving that dial. Um, at the moment, we've got three local authorities that have already written to the chancellor. Uh, on the back of the letter sent by the Essex Planning Officers Association to uh, the Chancellor. We've done some engagement at a regional level in relation to the East of England uh, Local Government Association, who've now got 
stamp duty relief on net zero homes as one of their sort of key lobbying aspects. And we've been working with Catherine, uh, one of the commissioners, to actually raise this as at the national level. So all of those three things, the fact that it's fractionally uh, new, these new homes are fractionally more expensive. Legally, we can do it. But if you remove stamp duty, they become less expensive than the future home standard. So all of a sudden, um, this becomes the game changer. And we know from the evidence that's mounting that 80% of first time buyers and second buyers want a what they call a green home, which is a carbon uh, zero home. So this is where the focus is at the moment. So uh, those are my sort of pithy updates. Brilliant. Well, that's fantastic. Um, I don't suppose we've got any sense as to whether this might get through. I mean, uh, who, who knows, perhaps, but really good to try to influence national policy in this kind of way. And great that it's coming from all 15 local authorities and coming from um, the planning um, sector, as it were, the planning professionals, because that 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 kind of sits outside um obvious political kind of interest um it's just about saying well this could make it happen really effectively so fingers crossed for that um uh, peter catherine victoria so peter uh, graham hi um, thank you very much for the update and the positive look in, going forward my concern is, is a bit of a contradiction going on because if i quote mount nursing and ingate stone where i'm a parish councillor we have one, two, three, four developments, one of which is completed on the Mount Nessing roundabout, and three of which are being done in Ingate Stone, one uh, on the old Ingate Stone Garden Centre with Blossoms, which is um, Red, Red Row. And then we've got uh, Carla Homes building another 75 houses, and also there's going to be Hallmark Homes building a fair home. Those are all within, I would say to you, under half a mile of the A12, uh, the noise level will be horrendous no matter what you try and do. And people are going to walk out of their net zero homes into pollution coming off the A12. We, we've never, ever allowed anybody, a developer, to build so close to a major road in the history of, of my knowledge. There's always been a cap as to how far from the A12 they should be or whatever. And the one at Mount Nessing is actually built right on top of or near a river which could be prone to flooding. We have surface flooding issues already. No one's taken account of the infrastructure to avoid that as and when these piecemeal developments are being built. And of course they are built under the current regulations. So my, my vision is, is somewhat concerning that if, if we've changed the rules on people's environment on which these, in which these houses are built, then it's all very well and good having them net, net, uh, sorry, net zero homes, as soon as they walk out the door, they're being subjected to all these other elements which can cause themselves um, health issues. And yet we seem to move the goalposts because they're being allowed to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, I've got an observation on that. I'll take the kind of comments and questions as well um, uh, and, and come back to you, Graeme, in a moment, um, because I don't want us to run over uh, the overall time for the SIGs, um, but a particular set of issues that you picked up there, Peter. Catherine, then Victoria. Uh, thanks, Jules. Uh, yes, yeah, so just to follow up on on what Graham was saying, um, we we are we have got a slot now to talk about this at the place based climate action network meeting at the Royal Society the Monday after next on the nineteenth of June. Um, I I wrote to the organisers and shared the letters and what we're trying to do and asked if. Um, we would be able to make an intervention from the floor. And they wrote back and said, well, actually, can you be on the panel, the closing panel at the end? <laughs> so <laughs> that was quite um, surprising. The even more surprising thing is that actually one of the other speakers on the closing panel is Lord Deben, the chair of the Climate Change Committee, which was the other um, entity that we wanted to access to try and get them to um, write a recommendation for this, which, of course, they write those sorts of things all the time. The government doesn't have to accept them, but it greatly increases the chances that government will take them seriously if the Climate Change Committee writes. So Jules and Graham and other Graham, who I'm not sure is on this call, it would be great if we could convene to have a quick 
conversation about that offline uh, sometime in the next week so that we could talk about how we want to talk about this at PCAN because Jules you're going to be there as well and Graham I think. Thank you, Catherine. That's good. Um, PCAN will be, if we can get them on site, that will be very supportive. And I know that um, John Gummer, Lord Demon, is really supportive of these things coming from local level because I talked to him about, about these sorts, uh, the, the the things that are happening within the county, and he's very supportive. So yeah, let's be hope great. we can do yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Thank Victoria. You. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's a great campaign. Um, I just th would urge you to move quite quickly with it before somebody else grabs it and runs with it. Um, because it's locally driven, which is great. I'm not aware of any other regions doing it. Um, I did put in the chat, you know, have you spoken to the LGA nationally about this, um, about a more national campaign? But if if Essex wants to get the credit for it, then you're going to need to move quite quickly um, because obviously the election's coming up, manifestos, lots of people are preparing manifestos, will be doing one. I think this is a great um, uh, campaign. It's a really quick win for any... Um, anyone seeking votes, it's a vote winner uh, for sure. And because um, it helps people buy more homes, it helps build more homes um, and it makes them more affordable and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that is, you know, it's, it, so it was just sort of moved quite quickly on it. You probably need some help. So I'm not gonna suggest who, what, why and how, but to help you run it into a more of a national campaign so that Essex can get some of the credit for it before somebody else nicks the idea. Um, and there are a number of these national campaigns. I'll drop one in the, the chat on Part Z, which relates to um, embodied carbon and that VAT issue on um, new builds more generally. But I wasn't aware of this one, which is good because um, I like to think I've heard of lots of things. <laughs> I hadn't heard of this one, which means a lot of other people wouldn't yet. Um, but if Essex wants to take the credit for it, then um, move quickly and, uh, and, and, and um, get some association with it and then get others to adopt it in their manifestos thank you brilliant thank you victoria great alan over to you uh thanks for taking and um, just to introduce myself i'm lucky enough to be uh, the county councillor for a, a wonderful village called brightling sea uh, on the coast and uh, i'm interested in the unintended consequences of the stamp duty exemption and, and what i'm thinking of is um is if the if a new home is dramatically or even slightly cheaper, what does that do to the value of existing homes? And I, I, I give you that from a background of a, a village that's a, a port uh, with lots of small cottages that they will do their best to be net zero. But I, I'm also having trouble getting over this. Um, position which is the same with cars as it happens uh, as, as a as a holder of uh, uh, a car a classic car that's uh, as, as old as the hills um the, the the there seems to be no seems to be no allowance for the fact that if you're going to start to build new homes they have yet to be built and the carbon Thank content you. of the build seems to override the day-to-day -day activity. And it's the same thing with, with things like cars. I, I, I go I'm, to- I'm, Alan, I'm, I'm, I'm pressed for time, so I don't want too long an intervention. We okay. can All right. have them on specifics. Is that is that okay? But let's just pick up on the kind of contradictions there. Graham, the, the, um, there were two kind of major ones there. One, well, the suggestion about the campaign, I think you can just kind of run with that, Catherine, about PCAN, but both Alan and Peter have just raised kind of wider development issues um, around the pressing for net zero. So not just talking about the stamp duty bit, but the but the wider. Yeah. How, so how, how are you kind of incorporating those into the thinking? Um, so so um, good planning and good sustainable development should be part and parcel of what uh, local authorities seek to do. And what we do know, actually, in terms of driving the um, the carbon reduction is good master planning in terms of where you put things. So addressing some of those points that uh, I think the, the councillor was raising in the first question in terms of floodplains, you know, proximity to roads, 
the environment all of those things should be being addressed in terms of a good planning sort of environment so that so the the net zero home is a component but it's still got to be well planned it's still got to be you know sort of a, a walkable neighborhood it's still got to have uh, a balance of different jobs uh, landscape etc cetera, etc cetera. so all of those things need to be part and parcel of what makes good place making and i think the uh, uh, councillor goggins question is really in terms of where this is intervening in terms of uh, the property is actually removing the price someone would meet, need to pay in terms of stamp duty so it doesn't actually uh, change the value of the property itself it just means when you're purchasing a home you can choose to buy a future home standard which government will introduce in 2025 which will have the stamp duty applied so you pay for that or you buy a net zero home and uh, there's no stamp duty. So in effect, it's then cheaper than the standard future home standard. And what we know is it will be uh, more uh, cheaper to run because your fuel bills will be less. It will be a healthier home and there are all of the associated benefits of a, a net zero property. So it's it's not actually a long term uh, factor in terms of the, the, the devaluation of the property or it's it's purely a removal of a tax system yeah. when you buy it um and just to pick up on peter's point um, and i will and as a link from this topic to the next one um it's just worth noting that in making the shift to electric vehicles we one of the biggest benefits will be a reduction in air pollution close to large roads so that's not a that's not a kind of a backdoor route to saying you should one should develop close to roads because there's still the noise issue and there are other issues that you rightly mentioned. But it's worth noting that within five to 10 years, I think that we will see a substantial benefit um, from air pollution and dry deposition on the land of, of nitrogen and um, uh, mainly nitrogen from vehicles. And that will have a big impact upon ecology as well. Um, I, I want to press on because we've got three more to do in the next just a few minutes before we get to the next section. So thank you for the comments. And um, Graham, thank you for that. That's really helpful. Uh, transport. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, in lieu of, or in aware of time, I will be super brief. Thank you. So Jessica. I encourage you to look at the two slides behind this on our EV strategy, which highlights the six objectives to that, um, but boiled down in simplicity, it is right charger, right place, and fits very much um, with the just transition that we've been talking about earlier, although we use slightly different terminology. Draft EV charger strategy will go live on Clean Air Day. It's the 15th of June at the same time as our new refurbished, remodeled Essex Air website. Other areas particularly of note are 5.2 million in construction and design funding from Active Travel England. That brings our total over ATF 1234 up to about 15 million. And um, despite ongoing delays to delivery, we still have a really good relationship with Active Travel England. To that end, the Commissioner, Chris Boardman, ex-Olympian, came down to view our new um, faction to Jaywick group. It was in last, um, last Commission update with drone footage, um, and we all cycled along that. So, hashtag humble brag, I cycled with Chris Boardman. And you beat him, um, and you beat him presumably, Tracy. No, no, I stayed at the back. <laughs> you don't want to be. Well, no, carry on. separate point. Um, very impressed with the route and they've asked us to do a webinar on it as best practice, particularly around the solar um, and wind power lighting. Also viewed Essex Pedal Power, we're now extending, expanding into Basildon, Colchester and Harwich. Uh, I'll leave it there, All right. I reckon. Yep, great, good. Thank you very much indeed. That's that's really important. Um, there's the summary of the of the charge. Um, so very good stuff. Some some kind of concerning national stories about the amount of money that's been cut um, 
to active transport nationally compared, you know, per capita in England, it's one pound a person a year. And in Scotland, it's 25 pounds. And I think in Wales, in the kind of 30 pounds. So whatever we can do to pr push this and to make sure it has effective outcomes, I think will help the national policy picture as well in due course. So um, uh, carry, carry on the excellent work is really, really important. Um, Carrie, you're going to talk about community engagement. I am indeed. Thank you very much, Jules. Um, so first of all, um, uh, just a quick look at our uh, comprehensive events program that we have been rolling out this year. So you can see already um, this spring we've been out to uh, a range of events with various different audiences. So it was young people for the Voices of the Future conference. Um, we've got a couple of business shows that we've been to and then some more general um, resident events. Um, we have also got a comprehensive programme of events that we'll be going out to over the coming months to promote the uh, climate advice packs, uh, the new app and of course the commission newsletter. Um, so we'll be out and about um, at those events uh, over the next few months. Delighted to say that we've been awarded for, uh, we've been shortlisted for a number of awards. Um, so the LGC Awards on the 8th of June, uh, in a couple of days time, we've been shortlisted there for the community involvement category and the climate response category. We're going to be at the MJ Awards on the 23rd of June, where we've been shortlisted for the leadership in responding to the climate emergency category. And then um, following uh, the awards of uh, carbon literacy bronze status, we'll be uh, off to their award ceremony to collect the trophy that you can see pictured in the top right um, uh, later this month as well, next week, in fact. Um, next slide, please, Louise. Um, so uh, John's already touched on this, so I won't go into too much detail, um, but you can see that we've been doing some work on the climate focus area, developing um, a, a logo and a look and feel for it. You can see up there we've got uh, the, the leaf representing biodiversity, uh, land use with the purple stripes, water and sun at the top right. Uh, we've been uh, working with a PR agency, Genesis PR, to develop the communication strategy and plan, which we will be rolling out over coming months. Next slide, please. Um, John also touched on this as well. So we were selected as one of five local authorities by Involve Public Participation Charity to be a part of their local climate engagement program. And we were out and about in various parish and town councils engaging with the local community uh, to produce reports, uh, which will then go to the local council to help them inform their local nature plan. Next slide, please. And then last but not least, um, we were delighted to have launched Carbon Cutting Essex on the 22nd of May, which was International Biodiversity Day, exactly a year on from when we launched our climate advice packs. Um, so it's a fantastic app. If you can move on to the next slide, please. Um, there uh, are a range of activities that people can do as part of the app. So there is a blog that they can, uh, uh, they can read, there's a video they can watch, there's a quiz they can take part in, and then there's a pledge that they can make. The idea is that we're targeting all residents in Essex and it will help people, um, it will nudge people towards making small changes um, that will uh, reduce their carbon footprint, but very often can also help them save money. Um, it allows them to track their carbon footprints, gives them feedback, rewards participation. Um, so by taking part in each activity, they'll win points, which they can then um, spend in participating businesses or donate to good causes such as uh, local charities and schools. So we're really excited to have launched that uh, app recently. I really would encourage you all to go on and uh, download the app. You do need an Essex postcode uh, to, to 
uh, to, to sign up for it. So if you live outside of Essex, then please use the postcode for, um, for County Hall, which I've popped in the chat. And I think that's me. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Kerry. That's brilliant. Lovely, lovely stuff. Yes, go with the app. That's 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 great. And good lot. A lot of awards. Loretta has just put in a fourth one that we've been shortlisted for uh, in the chat. So um, uh, we look forward to good news from those. But it's good to be listed anyway, because we're getting noticed. So, you know, that that is the key measure. Um, and finally, a just transition for a green economy. Um, last update. Thank you, Jules. Um, so yeah, I'll just do a whiz through of, of kind of progress since we last got together. So that's covering our three project projects, uh, which is Green Entrepreneurs, Green Start and the Youth Movement. Um, so on Green Entrepreneurs, so this is uh, the programme that we've launched to support residents aged 18 to 30 to establish green startups in Essex. Um, so this will be delivering an enterprise programme to them um, to give them sort of uh, additional skills in terms of starting a business and, and hope with, hopefully we'll get some really good ideas uh, for business startups coming through the program. So uh, so updates since we last met uh, have mainly been around us promoting uh, the program and trying to recruit people to join. So for the last couple of months we've been doing that. Deadlines for applications is the 1st of July and um, we're currently up to nine applications. So uh, any support anybody can give to help promote it would be much uh, appreciated. Um, but we're working closely now with colleges and universities as well to try to get the message out even further so we can get hit our 30 target for that first cohort. Um, it'll be a six week program kicking off uh, in July um, and running through August. And then so hopefully by the time we next meet, we'll be able to provide some really good examples of some of those businesses or business ideas that have come through, some of the outcomes and, and how the program has run, actually. So we're looking forward to, to seeing what it generates. So if we can skip on to the great start slide. Thank you, Louise. Um, so the Great Start programme um, is a business accreditation scheme. So we've been working this up over the last few months. And um, it's all about supporting climate and green growth ambitions of businesses, but really about helping them reduce environment, environmental impacts from their businesses and, and how they can have a positive impact. Um, so we've been working closely with colleagues at Provide um, to understand the principles that they use for the Working Well accreditation. And so we could embed them into the programme. Um, some of the recent activity is included in uh, stakeholder engagement and um, getting some insight in, uh, from businesses about what possible interventions they can take and what incentives um, they would like to see through the scheme. Um, really um, interesting to see that Braintree and Uttlesford are both uh, uh, part of our levelling up areas um, are really interested in launching the schemes uh, in their area. Um, we're going to kick off with Braintree first. Um, and that will likely launch around September time. So the next few months will all be about how we get comms out to businesses about the scheme, uh, working out resources that they can utilise uh, and, and then sort of confirming um, kind of what the pledges and those sorts of things are going to be for them. So, um, so more to report next meeting. And then finally, um, if I jump onto the youth movement slide, which is the next one, thank you. Um, so the youth movement is all about how we can promote economic growth, um, including career and skills opportunities um, from sort of peers within sort of um, youth age groups and with a really clear focus within that uh, movement around green growth. Um, so it's all about creating this by, by young people and for young people. So we're working very closely with our skills colleagues within ECC to take this forward. Um, so some of the recent activities that we've commissioned uh, a World Cafe event, uh, which will bring together young people from um, Canvey uh, to talk about the challenges and positives about living there and how they'd like to uh, sort of change and improve things as, as a kind of initial kickoff for this work. Um, some initial planning work's taken place with some young people already. Uh, it was a really good session. Um, but I think timing for them has been quite difficult. So we're hitting exam periods at the moment. So, um, so some feedback from that is actually to move the was to move the event back into into July away from the exams. Um, so yeah, so um, really good feedback. We're starting to engage young people on on it, um, and actually we're looking forward to getting some more new recruits on board over the next few weeks uh, and month, months and, and book people into that World Cafe event. Um, so yeah, hopefully when we next meet, we'll have lots to report on on all these programs actually and a bit more outcome driven. Um, but yeah, that's the update. Kristen, thanks very much indeed. Fantastic. Um, we we will come back to those as you say at the next meeting. Good luck with with them um, uh, over the summer. So that's all three of those important. I'm particularly 
interested in how we can use kind of innovative ideas to help boost the green economy. So green entrepreneurs and and, and green start a re great start really really important as indeed is engagement of of youth. So fantastic, that's great. Um, okay, so um, we will slide directly into the next item on the um, agenda, if we may, um, uh, where we come to the first of three presentations around the, the biodiversity, nature, land recovery um, areas. So the first of those is on lo local nature recovery. So Tim Simpson from Green Infrastructure and Drainage at ECC and Simon, Simon Lister, Chair of the Local Nature Partnership. So are you divvying up between the two of you? Or um, Yeah, th 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 thanks, yeah. Jules. I'm just going to do three or four minutes of, yeah. sort of context and then Brilliant. hand over to Tim. Brilliant. Um, possible, Louise, to bring up the slides? Um, yep, just a moment. On the Local moment. Nature Recovery Strategy. Yep, just a moment. Graham, you, Graham Underwood, you've got your hand up. Is that a deliberate or an in, uh, inadvertent? Mm -hmm. All right, Jules, not meant to be there. Thank All right, there. okay, sorry. I just wanted to check, Jules, you might have had something to add in there. Um, so if you can bring up the... Yeah, Ms. just to then M um, Maybe just to save time, Jules, we'll while, just the, press on. The thing, yeah. while the thing is that the slides are coming up, because um, I know we are a bit short. I mean, just what I was going to do is give a little bit of context. Um, as you may be aware, the 2021 Environment Act uh, required responsible authorities to produce and prepare local nature recovery strategies. And Essex County Council is the, is the, prince, is the responsible authority in this area. Um, and in response to that statutory requirement, they then, the council then set up the local nature partnership, um, which as you'll be aware that I chair, and one of our principal functions is to help produce this local nature recovery strategy. Here, it's there, thank you, Louise. Maybe next, next slide. And maybe after that, <laughs> thanks. Um, and um, uh, but one of the first things we did we did as a local nature partnership was was figure out that nature, of course, doesn't respect uh, political boundaries. So in order to make it cover the whole of Essex, which is going to do, the two unit trees have come in, so that the local nature recovery strategy that we're going to be producing will cover the, the whole county. Um, the government was a a little later than was originally anticipated in coming up with the, the regs and guidance for what should be in a local nature recovery strategy. So the local nature partnership, and if we could move on one slide, thanks Louise, um, uh, uh, has was set up over a year ago, set these four targets up. We've already heard about some of the, the, the sort of progress that's been made within those targets. And I, I'm just to emphasize one that John mentioned that the, the farm clusters and these farm clusters are, are so important, particularly to those first two targets, because they enable you to get the connectivity and scale that if we're serious about nature recovery, we absolutely have to deliver. And just one little example of that and, and how these clusters are so important was that in the North Essex farmer cluster, um, um, a, a little while ago, six farmers within that cluster have got together with a map and made a plan for what they're going to do along the river Pant in order to connect up the spaces for nature they've got on their individual farms to make them connected. And that's exactly the kind of thing that we want these clusters to do and that the clusters make it possible to, to do. Um, and that's going to mean more hedgerows. It's going to mean more ponds. It's going to mean more species rich grassland. So that's a sort of a great example of the good things that are already happening. But if we can just move on to the next slide. Um, a key function for us as a local nature partnership, particularly over the next year and in a way, particularly over the next six months, when we've got a draft of a local nature recovery strategy, is to, to start producing this strategy. And that's that's going to be our main focus for the next six months. And I'll now hand over to Tim, who chairs our local nature recovery strategy working group um, to explain how this is all going to work. Thank you, Simon. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thanks, Simon. Um, so, it's, yeah, it's, as Simon said, you, know, you can see really some of the important work that the local nature partnerships will be done in terms of advancing the conversation around nature recovery within within Greater Essex. Um, but also, as we've seen from those targets, one of the, the kind of key roles is in terms of uh, promoting the delivery of significant amounts of green infrastructure across the county and, and through the unit trees. Um, and I think that's really where the local nature recovery strategy is is 
really important. Um, I think it's going to be a, a critical tool that we can use to make sure that when we're delivering those green spaces, actually they're focused in the most appropriate locations and, and areas that will deliver the most benefits. Um, and I think that you know throughout all of these conversations, the right thing in the right place is, is absolutely critical. Um, as Sam said, we've already done quite a lot of work and one of the key elements of that was getting the local nature of partnership set up in the first place, but this is just a little bit of a timeline over the last year of the, some of the things we've been doing. Um, one of the key pieces of work was actually the appointment of our uh, local nature recovery coordinator. Um, so Helena has been in the role for um, just over a year now, doing a fantastic job, but she's really a, a critical link between um, both the partnership and all of the working groups within the partnership. Um, uh, linking the partnership back to Essex, but also um, she's going to be instrumental in the delivery of a local nature recovery strategy. And she's she's the lead for quite a lot of that work, um, working very close with me and others to, to make sure we, we're achieving the, the time scales that we're working to. Um, following on from, from her appointment, two of the key elements really in terms of, of delivery were forming some of those partnerships to, to start push, uh, pushing the conversations forward. Um, the first of those, as, as Simon said, um, was the setup of a local nature uh, recovery strategy working group, which is uh, steering the progress really of the of the whole of the whole document. Um, but also, we set up uh, a subgroup focusing more specifically on mapping, which is one of the key elements of delivery from local nature recovery strategies. Um, and and that started to make some some headway in terms of data collection early on. Um, Unfortunately, as, as commissioners and members will be aware, that there has been significant delays to the issuance of guidance around local nature recovery strategies and, and all the regulations associated with that. So we did put some of that work on pause, certainly in terms of the meetings that were taking place. However, there was an awful lot going on in the background, still making sure we were, were pulling together enough information so that once though that guidance was issued, we were really ready to hit the ground running. Um, and we were very pleased to see that guidance uh, in March of this year. Um, since then, we've really started picking up um, a lot of conversations with some of our, our key stakeholders. Um, one of those main groups is supporting authorities. Um, so supporting authorities are a new and really welcome addition to the regulations around local nature recovery strategies. And they mean that actually there'll be far greater involvement from uh, the district and boroughs in the process. Um, and then within that, we've also been identifying some of the key groups and elements of, of delivery within that. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, please, Louise. Um, so that's really just kind of where we are at the moment. This next slide provides a little bit of an overview of the, the kind of the high level timeline that we're working to. Uh, and I suppose really what members and commissioners are going to be most interested in is when you're likely to be able to see a, a sort of more or less finished version of this. And we're expecting that to be this time next year. Um, of course, there are a couple of key milestones throughout that process. I think probably the most important of those will be um, the public consultation, which we're hoping to take place in November, December of this year. Um, but there will be continuous engagement throughout this process. And really, the, the, the kind of key focus from, from DEFRA's perspective and, and from Essex and everyone else's perspective that we've been talking to is that this needs to be a collaborative document. We need to make sure that actually the, the ideas that we're promoting through the local nature recovery strategy are things that people are already bought into and, and are going to find relatively straightforward to implement once the, once the document's in place. Um, so again, just kind of conscious of time. So we move on to the next slide, please. Um, so this is um, really our kind of overview of, of how we want to try and organise that engagement. Um, and I should say at the start, this is by no means all of the engagement we're doing, and, and that would have been far too complicated a slide to, to show everyone, but this is really the sort of the high level view. Uh, and you can see really at the top of that diagram, the two key t key organisations around the Local Nature Partnership Board and Essex County Council being the responsible authority for delivery. Um, Sitting underneath the Local Nature Partnership Board, um, we've got the Engagement Working Group, Biodiversity Net Game Working Group, and the Agricultural Working Groups. And all three of those will be feeding into the Local Nature Recovery Strategy Programme. And you can see their links through from the Agricultural Working Group, specifically back to, to landowners and farmers subgroup, which we'll come on to in a minute. Um, we're also on the right-hand side of the screen, working very closely with um, the, the support authorities. So that includes both South End and Thurrock, um, but also all of the other districts and boroughs across the county. And the final supporting authority is Natural England themselves. We have 
um, the support of uh, a specific Natural England officer, one of their senior advisors to help with the delivery of local nature recovery strategy. Um, we have weekly meetings with them and um, they also feed back to DEFRA and get, get input. So we're having really kind of a two-way conversation there, which has been fantastic. Um, we wanted to try and kind of pick up as much detail as we could through these working groups. It's been quite difficult because obviously there's a, a huge amount of people that want to get involved with them. But we've identified... Um, a number of key subgroups. So they've been split into two sections. The first focuses on um, species and habitat subgroups. So you can see within that, we have a, a priority species subgroup, woodland subgroup, freshwater, a coastal marine group, and a grassland group. Um, but also we wanted to have a, another area which perhaps focuses a little bit more on some of those stakeholders themselves. We've already mentioned a couple of times really the importance of landowners and farmers as part of this conversation. So they've got their own separate group there although they will be feeding into all of these other conversations throughout the process. And um, the mapping subgroup we've already mentioned as one of the key kind of deliverables through, through this piece of work. Um, one of the pieces of work we've done as part of the Local Nature Partnership is um, agreed to reform uh, local wildlife site partnership, something that's um, had issues over the years in terms of resourcing. Um, but we're going to be promoting that because actually the local nature, the local wildlife sites are critical to feed into this process and going forward to, towards nature recovery. Uh, and then finally on that list, there is a, a group focusing on transport and utilities because we, we're aware, particularly around the conversation around highways, um, also network rail, other things like this. Uh, they're one of the central challenges when we talk about nature recovery, but also really one of the very big opportunities um, as a lot of these groups hold quite significant amounts of, of land um, that, that they can potentially employ to help us meet these targets. And just that, that's about it, Tim. Just about, yeah, absolutely. So, the final slide really was just a, a, an overview. And actually, I wasn't planning on particularly on talking to, to this. Um, this is just a, an overview of what we think the, the local nature recovery strategy will, will start to look like. I wanted to show you so you can see kind of some of the progress we've made. Um, and then I was just going to open it up to, to questions really about either this slide or anything else within the presentation. Fantastic, great stuff, Tim. Anything more on the back of that, Simon? Uh, no, Jules, other than just to emphasise what um, Tim said about mapping. I mean, a key element of this is to identify what we've already got on a map and then create an opportunity map as to what it's going to look like. And that opportunity map is going to be a key sort of outcome fr from this uh, this whole strategy exercise. Oh, fantastic. That's great. Um, shall we move on and have all three presentations and pick up questions? Because I think they will link across them. So that's that's really nice. Again, really like the way that this is going. I mean, it's a lot of engagement across the whole of the great, greater county, isn't it? That's really, uh, really amazing. Um, but as you were saying, Simon, if if the engagement can lead to um, six farmers in the pan coming together to redesign their farms and to voluntarily, as it were, make changes in time and resources, that's a further investment in the future of the county by making making kind of early progress. We're not just waiting to the publication of the strategy, but things are already happening at this time. This There's time. a huge amount happening across the board. Yeah. So that's so that's an important message to get across. It's not just organisational diagrams. It's, it's delivery Absolutely. already. Yeah. Brilliant. Lovely. Thanks very much indeed. Well, great. So um, let's come to the Essex Net Zero Innovation Futures presentation. Alexander and Jackie. Jackie, are you starting off on that? Or? Um, Alex, got the yeah. if we get the slides up. Maybe Alex, you start and then I'll pick up. Yeah, I'm just hopefully I'm sharing my screen now. Hopefully you can all see that. You are. Yes, yeah, great. Um, I'll just do a few slides initially and then I'll pass over to you, Jackie. Thanks. So uh, the Essex Net Zero Innovation Futures project is funded through DEFRA's Natural Investment Readiness Fund, which provided grants to organizations to help them build investment cases, uh, to develop nature-based projects that can attract private investment. So uh, it was about uh, bringing in private finance and private funding into nature. Uh, and in our project, we are working with some pilot landowners to help uh, develop scalable and replicable uh, replicable investment cases for nature and just very quickly just to uh say that uh so the project's led by essex county council and we've got a couple of technical partners uh one is finance earth which are a kind of impact investment advisor and they're leading on the investment case development uh we have got also downforce technologies uh 
that are using their kind of technology to work with the landowners and build digital twins of their land. And then they can help us uh, then provide the baseline, uh, past performance and projections of natural capital uh, assets. But I will uh, let Jackie talk about that in more details uh, later on. And we have got four kind of willing landowners uh, as a pilot site. So we have got uh, Abbott's Hole Farm, uh, which is uh, the Essex Wildlife Trust headquarters. We've got Bruxted Park, uh, which is a mixture of recreational and farmland. We've also got a, a form of farming estate at Wildfail, uh, and also kind of a historical uh, farming estate at Spence Hole Estate. So in terms of the main outputs, um, so to kick off the project uh, for pilot sites were selected, the ones I just mentioned. Uh, and they've got a total area of over one and a half thousand hectares. Uh, and each of these sites represents different habitats and land uses in the coastal and also in the upper catchment. So they represent uh, kind of a broad uh, range of habitats. And we are also looking to develop uh, natural capital projects that generate ecosystem services, uh, mainly around uh, carbon below and above ground, but also biodiversity and water quality. So uh, to do that, we are working closely with uh, the landowners to understand what they want to get out of their land. Uh, it is their land at the end. And uh, at the same time, we were providing them with a lot of the outputs and the data that uh, downfalls have generated, uh, which really helped them uh, inform their decisions in terms of uh, how they wanted to progress in this project. And once we have established uh, the, the potential for ecosystem services and for kind of new nature projects, well, we have done a bit of options assessment uh, and options appraisal just to refine the focus. Uh, and at the end, we've kind of focused on biodiversity net gain, potentially as a potential source of revenue and uh, woodland carbon and uh, soil organic carbon offsetting. Uh, and we have also already started uh, engaging with potential buyers of these uh, ecosystem services, such as, for example, developers or uh, big corporates that need uh, offsetting. Uh, and while we have been doing that, Finance Earth have been developing the investment case uh, and uh, drafts should be presented very shortly. Once we have the investment cases, we will then further refine them following discussions with the landowners uh, and start engaging with investors to test their appetite. Uh, and uh, lastly, as I said, we aim to make that uh, scalable and replicable. So we'll prepare an end of grant report and we'll look to uh, disseminate as much uh, of the learnings as we can through kind of various partners, through the farm clusters and various uh, channels that we've got. And just very quickly, just to show kind of the timeline and the structure, we have already done a lot of kind of the data, most of the data uh, part of it and the options appraisal. So now currently we are uh, kind of in this middle phase where we are talking to some potential buyers and off-takers of the ecosystem services and uh, developing the investment cases. So the project ends in September. So by then we should have the final investment cases uh, and the reports. And uh, just to give you just kind of a brief a summary of what the potential for the project is. So uh, if we if the landowners do decide to go ahead uh, with uh, the identified opportunities, uh, we can potentially sequester all the projects, can sequester over 24 tons of uh, woodland carbon over the next 100 years, uh, almost 50 tons of soil carbon uh, over the next 25 years and can generate uh, over 1,600 biodiversity net gain units. Uh, which should uh, enable a uh, kind of, of development, but also will provide a lot of area for nature. And kind of the last slide is just kind of the next steps uh, for the project. Uh, as I said, we are assessing the demand for biodiversity net gain and carbon at the moment, uh, and we'll be finalizing the investment cases uh, hopefully in the next few weeks. Uh, we can then go out to, to, to investors and come to the wider market and see whether uh, kind of any, any investors would be willing to, to support these projects. Uh, and lastly, once we once the project is over, we will look to embed uh, the learnings that we've got from the project. It is how do we make them more scalable and replicable. We'll uh, try and engage better with farm clusters and hopefully support the development of more farm clusters uh, and really hopefully use that as, uh, as a first step to kind of to the wider nature recovery in Essex. 
And I think some of the outputs that uh, downfalls have produced are going to be really key and really critical kind of to the to the wider uh, nature recovery in ethics. And I will let uh, Jackie talk uh, about that. Did you did you want the map, Jackie, or the, the slides? Yeah. Or I've got some slides. Do you oh, want you've got some slides. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Can I share my screen very quickly? Yep. So, um, what we realized, having gone into great detail with our if you stop sharing, Alex, and I can quickly share. Yeah, just trying to um, figure yeah, out how okay. to do it. Yeah. So what we realized talking to the landowners is that the opportunity costs um, in some cases needed to be much more clearly defined because you have to invest to be able to get access to some of these funds. Nevertheless, from a what I would say from a, a county perspective, we really began to understand that there was a lot that we could, um, you know, that we could really um, look at. So this is, we were then able to go from our four estates and generate um, a map for the whole of Essex for soil organic carbon. And it's, it's quite an extraordinary map because if you look at the little insert, that's the pant, which is you know, important because that's where a couple of the estates are and, and looking very healthy, okay? But if you look up sort of in the um, Northeast, you can see that there's a big difference between there and what's happening all over. Now, with this kind of data, we can zoom down to literally 10 meters square. So this, this is a map that can work for landowners, for authorities, for local authorities to really think about, you know, how do we encourage farmers to improve their soils to then lead to, you know, a better overall way of generating food, but without with a bit of land sparing. So you don't need to kind of always go out into grabbing more land just to grow the same amount of food. But there are huge potentials, of course, for soil carbon. But it is quite a, it's a sort of county of two parts. If you look at it, it's, it's really quite striking. Um, next thing that we had from Archie and others was very innovative ways about how to use the data to do very different things. So looking at alley cropping, um, you know, supporting different kinds of biodiversity options while still keeping farmers farming for food. So that was the other thing that we discussed, how to bring the, 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 it's like the biosolar. This is the bio solution for farming. It really kind of starts to integrate. And it gives you a very different picture on your um, landscape. So we were then able to produce a new index, which brings in the sort of the evenness, the distinctiveness, the, the um, habitat health, you know, how, how sort of tall are the hedgerows and so on and so forth. What is really interesting, so it just tells you, you know, you can zoom in, this is a particular farm. So where it's very bright, it's very good, it's very healthy. And you can see there are these trackways going all the way through the county. And I just literally asked how much of the county has got healthy habitat? Um, and I just got the answer back. In fact, it turns out that it's more than 50% is healthy habitat. Well, that's already uh, something which probably we hadn't really thought about because you think it's all in small clusters. So I think these big landscape maps give us a very different idea about how we can not just always improve what we've already got, which is good, but start to connect up pieces that could then help you make a kind of much bigger impact if you were to join all the, lot, the dots up. So where you see the bright color for a farmer is important because literally they're getting nature to do the heavy work because it's telling you about carbon coming into their farm without necessarily having to put fertilizers in. So if you're a farmer, this is really interesting. Biodiversity is helping you do your job. Um, and then just to say that we can map again, on top of all of that, interesting things like where are the birds, where are the threatened birds, where's the bird species written this. So it's possible to get communities now to really understand what they have locally, but where do they fit in to the whole of the Essex picture and for this to be updated regularly. So we don't have to wait 10 years to get the next picture. We can look at this Sort of every 10 days, we can start to bring people in and do localized uh, projects as well. So we've been talking to Tim and the others about expanding this a bit, but I hope that, you know, you kind of get a sense of we, the county has got a lot more there that we can do, um, but it's all in little pieces. And possibly we don't have the big national parks, but we certainly have lots of other things that farmers could really start to bring into their thinking when they talk about, um, you know, going towards net zero. They're also going to be able to farm with biodiversity in the landscape. So yeah, so that's, that's kind of where the data comes. And it's very important because it helps the investors see 
where they can have the biggest impact. It will help Essex see where it can have the biggest impact. And I think I'm, I'm really looking forward to the fact that when communities get their hands on these kinds of data, they can make genuine local decisions that will see them connected up to other communities as well. And so, you know, wildlife becomes something that's tangible. Anyway, so that, that was, that's the kind of the next stage, I guess, is opening up the opportunity space beyond the four, four estates that we've done. Fantastic. Thanks, Jackie. So we've got kind of close to real time data. We've got new, new forms of data. We've got overlays of carbon, biodiversity, generalized wider uh, indices of, of habitat quality, um, all giving a, a kind of new platform for the way things might go in the future. I mean, this is what it's all about, isn't it? It's kind of creating and it's to support, opportunity. You know, and... What Simon's doing with the LMP, but also planners, um, you know, everything that we're doing. And, and it means that we can start to say that the commission was was right to have a high ambition. Mm. Absolutely. This this demonstrates that it's going to be possible. It's not something that's tremendously impossible. Yeah. And Peter Davies just made the point that this ties up to other concerns as we were talking about housing and development earlier. As, as these maps emerge, they also talk, tell us where the real assets are and where yeah. the things that need to be looked after are, but also where the greatest margin for improvement might be to, to take something from status X to status A, um, whatever yeah. the, the kind of context. So yeah. very, very good. Thank you very much. Well, let's let's um, uh, continue with the biodiversity net gain because that is um, uh, building upon the these sorts of ideas. And then we can kind of open up for some further observations. So um, Jackie and Alex, thanks very much. I did like your map, Alex, um, that, that claimed kind of London and most of Kent under the term Essex. Yeah, I noticed that with the, Essex. <laughs> the, the Project Partners uh, uh, map. So I didn't know I that. I saw happened. that too. I hadn't, didn't know that <laughs> happened, actually. That must have snuck through um, without us seeing the kind of boundary changes that were going on. So so this is much more than Greater Essex. This is kind of you know, <laughs> a quarter of England now or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> nice work. Ambition. Uh, why not? Exactly. That's right, Peter. Very good. Um, so BNG, biodiversity net gain. So John and Lisa, are you doing this? Um, yeah. Yep. So over to you, John. Thank you very much indeed, Jackie and Alex. That was super. Brilliant. Great. And I think Louise is going to uh, put yeah. the uh, presentation up. Um, and just to say that um, very interesting because uh, Jackie mentioned the planners. And this is legislation that's coming at the end of this year, biodiversity net gain. And so we felt that we should prepare for this. I'm going to do this presentation with Lisa, who runs the country parks and has been part of a great team putting together these proposals of two pilot sites. So if we go to the next slide, uh, Louise. So just a, a word about biodiversity net gain. So it's a, a new approach to development that kind of attempts to leave the natural environment in a measurably better place than it was before the development. So it's going to be calculated using a metric developed by DEFRA and others, Natural England, that attributes biodiversity units, um, depending on what the habitats are going to be affected by the new development. It assesses the condition and it's a standard methodology. And the difference in the units before uh, the development and after gives you a percentage change figure. So developers in developing these sites uh, have to follow a mitigation hierarchy that initially tries to avoid any impact at all. But obviously, if you're doing development, that can't be achieved, but there's as little as possible. And then they try and reproduce the biodiversity on the developed site. And if that's not possible, they then look to achieve biodiversity net gain by purchasing biodiversity units on off-site. Off uh, as a compensation. And so there's an opportunity here to create new habitats or enhance uh, other habitats to be generating these biodiversity units. And that has to be done for 30 years uh, after the development has taken place. So it's a long-term um, uh, initiative. So this is all happening under the Environment Act 2021, and it's gonna happen for all new developments. And statutory, we need 10% biodiversity net gain. But in some authorities, um, notably Chelmsford in Essex, um, they're looking for 20%. So if we go to the next slide. Um, and um, I'm just sorry, I'm, I'm, did I say, Lisa, you were gonna do this one or is this me? I can't remember. It's you. 
it's me. Fine. Okay, great. Sorry, I haven't got the numbers next to it, so I can't see where I am. So great. So um, we're getting ready for November because that's when the statutory work takes place. Um, and we wanted to develop uh, pilot sites in Essex. There's no better way to learn about initiative by doing it yourself. And we want to share that with our local planning authorities, the districts, boroughs and cities. And also there's an, uh, a good opportunity as an early adopter, uh, the biodiversity units are likely to be more valuable because a lot of landowners are, are concerned about the 30 years and they're concerned about issues that haven't been completely resolved, such as uh, the inheritance market, for instance. So we think the units are going to uh, retail in a, in a very good way, hopefully, in the first few years. So getting in early is not a bad idea. Um, and um, there's going to be biodiversity net gain sites across all 12 LPAs because um, the legislation points you to go local with the uh, biodiversity net gain. So there's a, um, a focus on the, the local LPA. Um, and so um, the, um, this is quite important if you, for the redevelopment of parts of Essex because without biodiversity net gain, you can't actually develop a site. So I'm going to pass over to Lisa now, who's going to talk about the two sites that Essex County Council has put aside to develop this in a proactive way from actually um, this summer autumn. So over to you, Lisa. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, the first site is um, one at East Mersey in Colchester Borough. So um, it's currently an arable site. Um, it's currently got beans on it. Uh, and the plan is to convert it into a scrub grassland mosaic habitat, which we will then uh, graze with uh, cattle and sheep uh, over the next 30 years. Um, if you can, you, Louise, could you press on the map? Because you should get, um, that's it. Yeah. So that's sort of like the, the rough layout of it. So you can see we're putting, we're planting scrub, we're planting hedgerows and putting in species rich grassland. We're also, as you can see in the middle, I don't know if you can see the dotted line or dashed line that goes across, we're also putting in a public footpath um, since the, the uh, coastal uh, uh, destruction of the coastal wall there, the access along that side of um, East Mersey is quite difficult. So by uh, improving the access, we can get more local people using the site. Uh, and the wiggly line at the bottom actually shows where we've um, currently got uh, coastal um, uh, uh, coastal water actually coming onto the site already so we've got that natural um, uh, environment going on there as well so hopefully it's sort of like a very suitable um, habitat for the for the island we'll be trying to attract turtle doves corn buntings yellow wagtail skylarks those sorts of local birds that are currently in decline in that area so you know it hopefully uh, fits with the environment it's very close to um, Essex Outdoor so uh, they may, may well also be able to use the site um, next slide please uh, and the next site is at Martin's Farm which is in um, Tendring at St Ozith's uh, this is a restored uh, landfill site currently um, it's actually already in quite uh, biodiversity wise some of it is still in very good uh, condition it's already in a high level scheme but not all the site is of the same level so the idea with the biodiversity net gain is to extend that um, biodiversity level across the whole site and we'll do this by changing the grazing and cutting regimes across the site and managing the scrub um, better it's currently being um, under managed probably at the moment but with this site, it is very, very, a very public, uh, high use by public. So obviously we need to make sure that we are continuing to work with the parish council and with the people, the community that use the site to make sure that their accessibility um, remains, you know, remains, you know, very good in that area. So um, I should say that uh, some of this work will require quite significant um, capital infrastructure to begin with. So we'll be looking at putting in new fences, new water supplies and things like that. So um, the, uh, the money that comes through is op ab absolutely essential for that. Could I have the next slide, please? So from a financial point of view, um, John's mentioned about the costs of um, the units or the credits at the moment. Uh, so initially, we expect to get in about two and a half million pounds for this um, biodiversity net gain for these two sites. Um, 
of that 2.5 million, at least 1.5 million will be used over the 30 years to undertake all the work that we have planned. We've done some very detailed costings of what we think uh, we're going to spend over the 30 years. That does include inflation as well, as best we can um, estimate. So we have tried to be really careful with our planning. Um, but the really good thing with this, obviously, is the uh, payments do come up front. So uh, whereas most of us are used to countryside stewardship schemes or high level schemes where you're paid on an annual basis, the money comes in at the very beginning. So it uh, gives you that opportunity to um, upload your, your capital infrastructure at the beginning. Um, could, I, uh, could I have the next slide, please? Um, so non-financial benefits. I think one of the, I think as John has alluded to, I think there is um, this, this uh, BNG is quite well known out there in the farming and landowning community, but a lot of landowners are quite skeptical, skeptical about going into it. So very few of them actually have committed to putting their land into a 30 year covenant. So I think we very much see this as Essex County Council showing uh, landowners and, and farmers that it is possible and that it does make sense financially. And obviously we can be very open with what we're doing, how much it's costing and things like that in a way that perhaps other people couldn't be. So that is to encourage more people to put their land forward. And I think then that does help the planners with what they've got coming along in Essex. As we all know, we've got a lot of development coming along and we are going to need this additional land to do the offsite delivery. Obviously, it does enhance the local biodiversity. Both these sites should see significant, significant improvements, particularly the East Mersey site as a, a current arable um, site. It's currently obviously getting a lot of fertiliser. It will be having herbicides and things like that. So anything that we do to reduce the amount of uh, those sorts of chemicals and products going into um, the black water is obviously very good. And it being an MCZ is even better for, for the black water. So really, really important. Obviously, we've got an issue of flooding. And as I mentioned, we have got that, um, that realignment, natural realignment going on with the seawater actually inundating into that land. So creating a much more natural coastal um, coastline there. Uh, we're not having to manage a seawall there. So it, it becomes more sustainable um, in many ways. So that's really, really good. And obviously, reducing the amount of runoff that we have from coming from the farmland is also very good. Um, so, uh, and again, we've mentioned about local communities. A big part of this is making sure that local people have access to high quality green space. So that's very much part of the, the plans that we have. And it is a 30 year agreement. So it provides a very long term um, commitment to improving biodiversity locally. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Right, and just the final slide, um, just looking over the horizon, what is, what is, what is a BNG gonna mean for Essex? Well, we know there's going to be over 100,000 dwellings in Essex. So we've estimated something like 6,400 units. We valued that at about 168 million. But when you put in the other two unitary authorities, you're looking more like 200 million. But we've been very conservative in our assumption. So we think actually that's a sort of a, the low end of the scale. So um, and based on six units as a rough average uh, off site and two units being the net gain, we estimate that 1,900 hectares of nature sites are going to be delivered by this. So that's the equivalent of something like 13 and a half um, Hyde Parks. Um, and then when you think of what Jackie's doing um, in terms of all the other kind of things that we're looking at in terms of elms coming up the, the, uh, the street, carbon, water credits, EA schemes, forestry commission schemes, this is just one part of the toolbox. And I think we should be uh, really pleased that this is um, financially viable uh, and something that really can deliver uh, right across the, uh, the 14 districts and unitaries of Essex. So uh, a very exciting scheme that I think we're gonna have a lot to learn in the next year or two. So if we can stop there, I think. Mm -hmm. John, thank you very much indeed. Excellent. Well, thank you to all six of you for the uh, really, really good coverage and um, issues relating Fantastic developments. Um, a lot of these are input measures because we're just getting going and it will be quite important as we proceed to make sure that we've got impacts um, and stories about those. You know, when do the first turtle doves appear on that site? 
uh, Lisa, for example, you know, the, the, the noticeable impacts to local people, which I'll come back to in, in, in a moment. And we want to be telling those stories as well as all, all the inputs, but that's, that's great. So um, open up for questions on, on these issues. I've got Simon and Yerema. Um, uh, Simon, um, observation, question from you. Uh, th thanks, uh, Jules. Something about what what John and, and Lisa say about BNG. I mean, it's that they're absolutely right that this is a fantastic opportunity. Um, I do have a slight concern, um, and I hate being a bit of a damp squib, but that I think people might be able to help on. What, what, one is that I'm hearing from, um, or I was hearing from a, a developer the other day. Um, that if biodiversity net gain remains at 10%, which is the statutory minimum, although, as John said, local planning authorities can go higher, and the local nature partnership board would like to see that go up to 20%, that if it is only 10%, a lot of that they will, the developers will try to make that gain on site within the development. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, because access to nature is, is a crucial uh, element, a, a part of what we're all trying to do. Um, uh, but if it's going to be a really attractive thing for farmers and it's very important for that nature recovery that it is then i think that that it really does need to go up to 20 percent and i haven't had a chance to talk to you about this john but um i had a slightly concerning email from one of the senior planners at chelmsford the other day saying no 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 that we haven't decided on 20 percent it's it's sort of you know it's, it's still under consultation and and Emma Goodings, who chairs the Essex Planning Officers uh, of, uh, Association and is on the Local Nature Partnership Board, is also saying she's picking up a lot of concerns about the local planning authorities that, you know, well, 10% is the statutory minimum. If we can just do that, it's going to make our life easier. And as a Local Nature Partnership Board, I think we've got quite a lot of work to do if we want to see local planning authorities in Essex, and we do, go for 20 percent and and i think you know that's going to be significant for for doing the sort of ambitious things we want to do if we get that 20 percent and i just wanted to make that point in case any councillors are listening and feel they can help or anybody else on this call feels they can help we'd love to work with them to to because it's going to be a priority for us as well as doing local nature recovery strategy over the next few months to try and encourage as many local authorities as we can to go for 20 percent bng and i don't think that's in the bag at all right now um and um and it is really important and i would just just want to solicit any help anybody feels like giving to try and help us make that happen thanks really good point simon thanks very much uh yeah anybody who can help um simon and others on the 20 percent goal please get in touch let's see what we can do um yerima you're on you're on, yeah you're on yeah. mute at the moment mm. Okay, just press the space bar and you should unmute. Mm -hmm. No, all right. Whilst you try and sort that out, I'm coming to Paul. Paul Thorogood. Thank you. Yeah, I'm also a district councillor and uh, Emma Goodings is our head of planning at Braintree. Um, so yeah, I'll definitely help push the 20% um, for BNG. That'd be really good. Um, I just want to mention just very quickly, uh, last month at uh, Essex Hall Council, I had a motion um, which was about um, preparing Essex for um, climate change adaption, uh, adaptation, sorry. Um, because uh, in the news a couple of months ago, Baroness, well, the government's um, climate change committee published a report, and Baroness Brown in the news said that not enough was being done across the country, not not Essex, but, you know, across the whole country. And obviously, you know, what, the, what this commission is doing is brilliant, especially in just two years. But um, I was just concerned that the report covered like houses, hospitals, roads, railways, but also food and energy and water supply. Um, and I mentioned in, in my motion about coastal erosion and the, the, the conservative majority groups need to run with that more than anything else. And they just said, Every, oh, no, we don't need to do any, don't need to worry about any of that. We can, it's all being taken care of by the Essex Climate Action Commission. But um, as John Meehan's on, the, on here, I just wanted... Um, you know, what, what is being done, especially for water and food supply. Um, 
because uh, you know I don't I don't believe we've had a new reservoir built for thirty years in Essex. You know, and obviously, you know, with the supply chain issues, I just feel like more more should be done on those fronts. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Sam, were you coming in on the back of that? Yeah, if I yeah. might, uh, yes, Jill, please do. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so thanks for the question. Um, we are certainly uh, very concerned about resilience and um, sort of the, the things that are being done are really focused. The only strategic game in town to build resilience is this land use change piece that we've been talking about today. That is absolutely fundamental. How can we equip our coastline to better manage extreme weather through having more salt marshes? Um, how can we better equip our landscape to absorb water when it arrives and store it in the landscape for when we need it in the summer? That is all about more natural green infrastructure, reducing runoff from farmland uh, and creating space for the landscape to hold that water. So the land use change piece here, which is all around the move to sustainable farming, creating those spaces for nature, that is fundamental. And achieving this 30% natural green infrastructure is absolutely at the heart of building resilience. Alongside that, greening urban spaces, again, to absorb water when it lands um, uh, and protect urban spaces from overheating, absolutely fundamental. The one thing that we haven't talked about is water scarcity. I don't know if you are aware of Water Resources East. So they are doing um, the regional, they're working with the water companies to do the regional water plan for the East of England. And they are very clear that we have a water emergency. Um, we have a very serious water scarcity problem. There is a plan to deliver water out to 2050, but it relies on building more reservoirs, cutting consumption very significantly, so improving water efficiency, better managing the water, better managing our landscape. There's a lot of nature recovery built into those plans, but it's all interlinked. And actually, we're working on a water strategy for Essex with the water companies and Water Resources East right now. But all it will do will be pull out these core links to action in uh, people's houses, action for businesses, and critically playing into this land use change piece in the nature recovery. That strategy needs to be a core part of the nature recovery strategy that, that Simon has already talked about. So there is a huge amount of work, and I'm really happy to take a conversation offline um, to talk you through the detail there. But I, I couldn't agree more. It is a critical piece of uh, the climate world that we don't talk about enough. We are doing work, but as ever, there is a mountain to climb here. Well, well summarised, Sam. Thanks very much indeed. Um, and thank you for raising that, Paul. That's really, really helpful. I mean, there are some things that are, are going to be out of our, as a county, out of our immediate control yeah. the worst of it offline with sam if possible that that'd be great thanks yeah please do that's great and that, and it just makes the point that what we've been talking about here is not just about nature recovery it's about resilience and adaptation as well and and controlling and avoiding stressors long term and short term large and small um into the to, to the economy culture and ecology of the county so really well put um, Yarima, let me let's try again. Maybe it was your mic was having a problem. Do you want to have another go? No, no, we're not hearing you. I'm afraid. I know you're not off. You are off mute because I can see that on the screen. But we're just not picking up, picking you up on your on your mic. I'm afraid. Um, other other questions or observations from from colleagues, others um, on the call. Andrew, did um, you, Andrew and Pete, did you have anything to add to this from the from the Wildlife Trust point of view? I mean, obviously, Abbots Hall is, is was mentioned as one of the examples, and this is um, as an example of a large scale uh, third sector voluntary organisation in the county. All, yeah, thanks, Jules. Um, yeah, I mean, we're we're doing the same work that the council is doing at Abbots Hall at the minute, so I think it'd be really good to kind of cross pollinate in terms of uh, lessons learned and how we're taking that forward, because I'm sure there's many things that we can share. Uh, to get um, uh, shared knowledge. I think the main thing, certainly nationally, the uh, Wildlife Trust across the UK are working on BNG, but the big thing is around additionality. We mustn't lose sight of that additionality. There's a lot of talk about income generation, and as a charity, we're obviously keen on that um, income generation. 
But the additionality that Simon referred to is what BNG is all about. And we must push for that to make sure that there is actually that net gain, because I can see it being diluted to the extent that actually there is no net gain. And the second quick point is that, you know, if a developer is uh, is developing a site and that habitat is then lost, it, it kind of is a little bit ironic that we're talking about 30 years. If you've lost something, you've lost it. 30 years is just 30 years. And what we're pushing for is obviously where possible to have protection and restoration in perpetuity rather than just the 30 years. So that's the conversation that we're having with DEFRA at the moment. Very good point. Thank you, Andrew. I can see, Jeremiah, you've morphed into Heather. So you've moved into I another have. room. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we can hear you. That's, that's oh, that's fantastic. Okay. Great. So my, my, my question is, um, in, in the way that uh, BNG is calculated, and I know that it's very uh, technical, but uh, basically there's um, a spatial factor. So if you're in the same local authority, you get full points for your offset, uh, for your biodiversity offset. But if you're in a neighboring um, lo local planning authority, then it gets discounted. You, you only get 75%. You can only count 75% of the net gain. Now, if we compare um, Essex with its 40, uh, sorry, 14 um, district councils, which are the local planning authorities, and you compare it to a county like uh, Cornwall, which is unitary and has just one planning authority for, the, for sort of a large county area. Um, so, we, we have these two schemes, these two new, new Pathfinder um, habitat banks. Um, there's, there's an issue where, you know, we, we're addressing a need that's, that's Essex wide, but um, the way the policy is put together, or the way BNG is put together, we, we're, we're getting penalized um, for sort of trying to trade them over um, district boundaries. And I'm wondering if something can be done at uh, planning policy level to, to unite the, um, the districts for the purpose of, of trading BNG. John, is that you can, or is that Simon? Yeah, yeah well, can, I, can I answer that? That would mm. be great. Um, because um, you're absolutely right. It does um, point the net gain locally. And in many ways, uh, you, you remember, it, it kind of reflects the political system in that districts, boroughs and cities are probably going to want any gain, as they always do, to happen within their borough and boundary, I think is a reality. Um, but then it can go to the adjacent borough or district. Um, and after that, it will go uh, beyond that. So there's, there's advantages and disadvantages of that system. The advantage is that every borough and district in Essex will have, you know, um, but BNG sites. So that's, that's an advantage. Um, however, you still have the option as a developer to put your BNG elsewhere, but I think I think there's a I think there's a recognition within the legislation there's a political imperative to for local councillors to want that gain to go locally. The other thing I was going to very quickly say, Jules, in answer to um, um, Simon's questions, was that we did build in the um, um, the on-site versus the off-site into our calculations. So 75% 70, of our calculation is that we're, that will be met on-site. So we're only talking about the 25% going off-site. So um, that we've already built that in some of our calculations. And the second thing I was going to say was about um, the 10%. Now, we all know that local developers try and make their development as attractive as possible. And so they've got a statutory minimum of 10%. Our hope is also that they, in order to actually make it very attractive, they offer a lot more to uh, appease the planning departments and can say, this is a great scheme, look at what we're offering. So we think that they'll go beyond that minimum as well. Um, and of course, in answer to Andrew's uh, question about, you know, it will be diluted. Well, the legislation is there for it not to be diluted. Developers should not be coming to the table and said be able to dilute it to 0%. That's that's illegal um, from the statutory per, uh, point of view. So okay, John, we hope good, developers will. Yeah. Yep, good point. Okay. Um, but if, of course, if it was 20, then people would be starting at 20 and bidding upwards from 20. So yeah, I think yeah, one could make yeah. the same argument about 10 being a, a floor yeah. and hoping for mm -hmm. higher bids. Um, if it yeah. were 20, that would guarantee all at 20. Let, let's, mm -hmm. let's see how that develops. But I think a really good point made. Thank you, everybody. This is fantastic. We're into AOB. I know that Louise has got two AOBs, and then I just want to say something about the next meeting. Um, very briefly, Louise.
Yes, thank you, Jules. Um, two brief things to bring to your attention, everybody. As a commission, we've been invited to attend an inaugural workshop of the East of England Climate Commissions, which is happening at the University of East Anglia in Norwich on the 6th of July, so a month from today. Uh, what I'll do is I will circulate that invitation around to everyone. If uh, any of you would like to attend, please do let me know. We would be delighted um, if you could do that. And the other thing to bring to your attention uh, on the back of today's meeting really is our next um, biannual climate summit, which is happening on the 31st of October. Uh, it seems a little bit uh, far away, I know, but it will, it will come around very quickly. That is also on the theme of land use and green infrastructure. It's gonna be taking place in the morning, uh, somewhere in Chelmsford, venue to be confirmed. But we do have two really great speakers we've managed to secure for that. Both Lord Deben, uh, of the, who will, is the outgoing chair of the Climate Change Committee, and also Tony Juniper, chair of Natural England, will be speaking at that event in person. So I wanted to let you know about that. Invitations will be going out shortly, so please watch your inboxes, and we hope to see you there. Louise, thanks very much indeed. Fantastic. Well, uh, just uh, I'll finish up by saying thank you to everyone. Thank you to all the presenters. Really covered a lot of interesting territory there. Um, lots happening in, in real time at the moment. Our next meeting is on the 12th of September, same timing, 11 to 1. Um, that's going to be focused on net zero and levelling up um, the green economy. And the exam question for that meeting is, how does climate action improve the lives of people of Essex? So we're very keen to kind of to turn all of this good work and these these inputs to all of the different areas of the seven six and the detail that we've seen here today to being able to summarize if someone says well what has the climate action commission ever done for me kind of thing that we have at our fingertips a series of really good um, stories about the impacts of the work um, of course, we can dig into all that we've talked about. One of those stories might be the investments that's been able to be attracted into Essex, as we mentioned earlier on, or they might be about specific impacts for particular groups of people in Essex. They're, they're, we're not short of material, um, but I think we need to press that into a form that gives us the, 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 the easy shorthand to say these are the kinds of impacts that really are making a difference for people of Essex as we make the transition towards um, zero emissions as, as, as soon as possible. So that's the 12th of September. More details following on from that. Um, uh, thank you again to everybody for your contributions um, today. Um, fantastic, great presentations from, from everybody. Thank you for sticking to the time and thank you for the comments and questions, everyone. Um, have a good summer, of course. I look forward to seeing you in September. Um, and uh, keep up the brilliant work, everybody. Thank you. We, we're leading the way, I think is fair to say. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank